Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian Edel and today I'm going to talk about um, a version of control library for C++, a uh, dependency injection library, so similar to Boost DI but with a different focus. Uh, about me, I work for Tioco in telecommunications, I work in the Vienna office, I've been a C++ programmer for 18 years, I'm the maintainer of Boost property tree and at work I develop the ISC++ library. Um, the background for this is, uh, so what we do is we develop applications that optimize radio networks. And there are two, two main products. One tries to optimize an existing network and the other tries to cover an area with a completely new network. Or maybe not completely new, but you know, you have a city and you have some transmitters there, but you want high bandwidth, LTE, microcell coverage, well, our program can do that for you automatically. And what it does is, it tries to find a minimal cost solution for covering your area with, while, while still reaching certain quality goals, uh, like network coverage, uh, data capacity, stuff like that. You can configure what the goals are, and it tries to search for a good solution for that based on, well, here are candidate locations where I can place new transmitters and then I have to connect them all uh, and they shouldn't interfere too much with each other. So the, the problem space is huge for this, right? There are thousands of potential locations for, for transmitters and uh, there's the question of how do you turn them, their directional antennas, uh, you have sometimes you have different models of antennas to, to choose from. Uh, you have to decide how do I connect these to the backbone of my network. Um, so what a program does is, of course, it uses heuristics to find a solution, and we have quite a few heuristics to choose from. And we basically want to build a an efficient algorithm by experimenting, well, we can use this heuristic for a bit, then try to reduce the cost by using a different heuristic. And um, so what we do is we build this algorithm from building blocks. Like there is a building block that says, try these al other algorithms in order until you have no more improvement. If you try one, it does something, you try the other, it does something, you try the first again, maybe it can find something better now. And so <coughs> what we want to do is we don't want to recompile every time we change this configuration, but we want to have a configuration file that we say, okay, well, um, let's just change something, run again, without having to recompile everything. And maybe even say, well, you know, um, we look at this particular optimization problem and we know, uh, well, this algorithm combination works good, wor works very well for this situation, like a city where you have small cells, lots of them to place, uh, and a different algorithm might work better for covering large open area where you want to place fewer, larger cells. And so we want to be able to decide at runtime what algorithm we want to use. And the solution for this for us was use a dependency injection library that can be configured at runtime. So we have all these algorithm components, we register them, and then we have a configuration file that says, well, take Lego block A and connect it to B, and then build up from that. Um, so when we started this, this was several years ago, there, my colleague who, who, who drove this path uh, said, well, I can't find any good C++ dependency injection library. It was, I think, 2012 or 2011. So just after C++ 11 came out, and we wanted a library that made use of like the news, the shared pointer, and stuff like that. There were none. And even the old C++ 98 libraries, they had problems like if uh, the component you want to inject uses multiple inheritance and you actually want to, like, the, it's the second base class is the interface that I want to get out. It would just, it would at some point use a reinterpret cast and therefore give me a back of wrong pointer and crash. So he started IOC++, his in, in, injection library, 
and he went through several design iterations. He uh, was at version 3 when I, basic, when I rejoined the company after a year at Google. And I looked at it and said, there's some good ideas there, but it can still be improved. And so this is the fourth iteration of the library. Um, and I think the result is pretty nice. Uh, so the features of IOC++ is it's a complete de uh, type erasure library. So you, the, the dependency container is not a template. It's just a class called container. There, the templates, its member functions are templates, but internally everything gets type erased. Uh, which also means that we can do separate compilation. So you take this container, you pass it through a, an, through a function uh, to a function by reference to a function in a different module. And it can, there it can configure, it can add information about components defined there. And the, the main library doesn't even know about the interfaces that get implemented. Like the, the owner of the container can pass it everywhere, never know about any class in your project, and then pass it somewhere else. And if that thing knows about the interface that it wants to get out, that's enough for it to use that. So there's complete type erasure. Um, lifetimes, uh, and think in, in Boost DI, those are called scopes. They decide, well, <coughs> if I want an object out of that container, how long does that live? Do I share it? Like, uh, there's two typical lifetime times, which is uh, singleton, which means the container creates one object of the type and gives it out to everyone who asks, asks for an object of the type. And there's transient, which means everyone who asks gets a new object. But there is also more complex lifetimes, like maybe in a web server you have a request lifetime, which says, well, for the duration of this request, um, hand out hand out this object once the request is over and the next request starts to hand out a new object or maybe a user session is a scope or maybe you want thread local objects so the thread is the scope and because we we didn't know at this point what kind of scopes uh, what kind of lifetimes we would need uh, we wanted this to be a user extension point and so those are extensible and again this does not use templates actually so user uh, extension of lifetimes is, can be in a completely separate uh, compilation, in a complete, completely separate source file. Um, the other thing is that since we build our tree from a configuration file, the configuration file just contains strings. And we wanted to say, well, this component wants an integer as a parameter for, I don't know, how many maximum iterations should this algorithm do. And we wanted to say, well, we could now, in the configuration file, we would have to discover that this wants an integer and then convert the value from the configuration file to an integer. Or we could just say, well, the container already knows. We want the container to be able to say, well, give me anything, a string, and I'm going to convert that to the target type. And of course, these conversions need to be user extensible. So that's another feature of the library. You can register conversions and say, well, here's a conversion from string to int, or from string to boost optional of int. And the final thing is that because we build complex object trees, we want to say, well, we don't want to say, this interface is implemented by this component. And if you want something more complicated, well, you can do it. It takes more effort. The, the, this is our core use case, that, that we have multiple uh, classes implementing the same interfaces. We have in our application, I think we have about 50 classes implementing maybe 10 interfaces. So being context dependent, like, for this object, the interface should be implemented by this component. But for this object, it should be implemented by this component. This is a core use case, so we want to make th this the, the default. Uh, so let's look at uh, basic usage of the library. The, you have to do four steps. You create the container object. 
you feed it reflection information about all your components that say, well, here's, I have this type and the constructor needs these arguments. Uh, the library is not as sophisticated so that it actually gathers this information itself. You actually have to t tell it and you also have to tell it the names like everything in the end is string based so you tell it, okay, I have an argument and it's called I. Um, then you define the object graph and that part does, no, does only use strings. Uh, you will see that in the example in a moment. And when you've done that, you can retrieve objects out of the container and the container will create them, will create the dependencies, hook it all up. So let's say um, we have an interface called A and it has a virtual function. We have a class B that implements this interface in a very simple way. Uh, it has an integer argument to its constructor. And then we have a class C and that one wants an A as a dependency. Well, <coughs> so the first thing you do is you, you create a container, which means you, you create a container. And as you can see, this is not a template. And then you configure the container and you tell it, okay, so I've got a type called B and its constructor wants one argument of type int that is called I. And this type B implements A. And I have a type C and that constructor wants one object argument of type A. Uh, well. So value arguments are by value. Object arguments, uh, the question was, does it want a shared A or just an A? Object arguments are passed by shared pointer, always. Um, even, so, so, so the, the whole lifetime thing is, does it get something new, is actually part of the final object configuration and not part of the reflection information. So you could say, well, in this instance, the object gets its own A, and in this instance, it gets a shared A. Yes, a question. If you change the shared pointer to a reference, will you get the reference? If you change the shared pointer to a reference, it won't compile. Um, so, and then you can configure the object graph, and you can say, well, I want and I want to define that there is an object of type B where I is mapped to 1. And since this is the, the name of this object is empty, um, it, it will say, okay, when you ask for a B and you don't specify which one, you get this one. And notice that of type here gets a string. So what it does is actually here, um, you could here specify a name for this type, a runtime name. If you don't, it will use runtime type information dot name to deduce it, to, to build a default name. Um, but I also want a different object of type B called B2, where I is mapped to 2. And then I say I want an object of type C called named C, where the A argument is mapped to this B2 object. And if I retrieve that named C object here, well, I say, okay, give me a C called named C. The result is again a shared pointer. All objects that come out of this container are in shared pointers. And I know that, well, this A, if I call get, it will return two, because that's what, it, what I mapped here. But if I ask for a C that does not have a name, it says, well, you didn't configure that, but for every type I create a default object of the type where every parameter is just mapped to its default. Mm -hmm. And the default for any object argument is the unnamed object of the type. So it, when I configured an, an unnamed B here, it also made that available as an unnamed A. The C wants an A argument and the container says, well, you get the unnamed A, which is the one that has the one in here. Questions about this? So, uh, so na okay, so let's on name C. So name C, uh, when you're configuring it, you're saying name C exists inside of this uh, 
container. Yes. It is a type C. And how is the map? What does it mean to map something to something else? It means um, is that sort of just a? Um, so the question is, what does it mean to map something to something else? So the type C says here, well, I have an object argument called A. So when I say map here, I say map the argument A to some value. And the container will say, okay, you've given me a string here. How do I get from a string to an object of type A? And the answer is, well, I look, I look for an object call with, with, this, with the name of this string and I instantiate it. If you put the order, if you inverted the order of the configure, uh, does that mean it won't work? Do you, does it require that, in like a, a pre-declaration of B so that name C can actually do a map? The question is, um, is this order sensitive? Some parts are order sensitive. In particular, you have to register types before you can reference them in an object specification. But um, I could reorder these. The object, these are resolved lazily, so I don't need them to be, I don't need a B2 to be already configured when, when I write this line. I could do, do this one first, and only when I actually ask for the object does it check if there is one. Steven? So if you make a cycle, does it go into infinite recursion? No, uh, if I make a cycle, it will throw an exception. Okay. It has built-in cycle detection. What is the type of named C? What do you mean? Which? Well, you put auto there, but could you put C? Um, the type is shared pointer of C. Oh, okay. So resolve of some t some type returns a shared pointer to of t of this type. You have an object of type A also named in there. Which one will default C here? If I have an object of type A also configured in there, um, well. A is abstract, so that would not work, but the answer would be um, the latter one overrides the former one. So I, the, the thing is, I actually already have one, because the moment I, the moment I register the type B, I already have an unnamed object of type B. So what I really do is here, I override it with a different configuration, because the default one wouldn't work, because it would say, well, hey, you didn't map anything to I. The argument I has no value. So it would actually fail to fail to instantiate it. So and the multiple inheritance, like say uh, an object D also inherits from A. That's yeah. kind of order of in which you create those or determine which A you get. Um, so the comment is if I have multiple uh, classes implementing the same interface, the the default object for the interface is yeah, probably the one for the type you configured last. And the solution for that is to explicitly override for an interface what the default is. Yes? So default C, um, sorry, uh, so name C, uh, a, 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 when you asked it to resolve, it was able to find name C because it was put in there. Yes. Default C wasn't put in there, so, I mean, there was no object of, so where I'm, I'm like, how did it resolve that an unnamed object of type C should use the unnamed type of B? So the question is, when I ask for the unnamed object of type C, how did it resolve to the unnamed object of type B? Yes? Yeah. So the answer is, f for every type, there is an unnamed object default configured, where every parameter defaults to its default value. And its default value could be either something configured when you do the reflection information. For example, I could actually provide a default here. Mm -hmm. um, for value arguments, if you don't have a default, then it will look for a configured converter from void to whatever the argument type is. Um, for objects, if you haven't configured a default, it looks for the default object of that type. And the default object for A happens to be the default object for type B because B provides A. So it sort of went through and said, okay, you have the default here, should take the default here, you overrode the default. In yes. That so, statement. so the default of for s the default for C's argument should use the default for A, and I overrode the default for A with this line. So it took this B. 
Yes. How do you handle errors? So, for example, when you make a mistake in the name, since it's a string, do you huh. verify whether there's a dead binding or something like that? How do I handle errors? I throw exceptions. Yeah, but would you verify whether the bindings are oh, dead? Oh, yes. Because so, no one will ask for it ever. If an, uh, because no, oh, um, no. So if you don't ask for an object, if a binding is unused, it won't be checked. Uh, for 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 some 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 parts will be checked. So if I say off type foo bar and I haven't registered the type foo bar, that won't work. That will throw an exception at the time of the configure. I think if I do a map of a parameter that does not exist for that type, it will throw an exception at configure time. But if I say 2b3 and I haven't configured an object b3, it won't. It w will only throw the exception when you actually ask for the, the configured object. Because it has to wait until, well, you might, be you might configure this object later. Yeah, but if you don't ask for it ever, it will be just there. Yes. So if you don't ask for it ever, some errors will not be discovered. That's correct. OK, so these two were basically answers to some of the questions. So if th for every register type, there is a default object. And you can configure an object with the empty name to override this default object. And one more thing is that object names are namespaced to the types. So I could, this is important for default objects, of course, because, well, there is an object with the empty name for type C. And there's an object with the empty name for type B, and I don't want those to conflict. So I can I can I could have called this C object B2, and it would work. And then ask for B2 here as a C, and I it wouldn't say, oh, but B2 is a B, and this doesn't work. It would say, well, okay, here's your C. And if I ask here, if if it's called named C, if there's no B2 object of type C. But I ask for a B2 object of type C, it was a, I, I don't have such an object. So the object names are namespaced to the types. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you can do in the configuration. As I said, there are two parts. There's reflection and building an object tree. Um, and for reflection, there's two things, type and factory. Type is basically a special case of factory where you register a constructor as the factory. And factory is generally says, OK, um, I have something that produces a T. And the thing that produces this is some function. It could be a lambda. It could be a free function. It could be a member function. So uh, the factory function is an arbitrary callable. Um, I can either say, let it use the, type, the name of the type, or I can specify it explicitly. I specify the arguments to the factory with like this. I say, well, the dependencies are, well, there's a, ve a value argument, there might be an object argument, and so on. Uh, I have this provide section that says, OK, this type implements these additional interfaces. and I also have the ability to specify optional arguments by saying, well, this object also has a setter. And if something is mapped to this setter, then call a setter. If not, don't. And I ca also can call uh, an additional, once everything is set up, I can tell it, on and once you've done that, call this initializer function to do some final validation or, or maybe open connections or something like that. Uh, there are three kinds of arguments. You, we've seen value argument and object arguments. So value arguments are passed by value. It's always a new one. It's really meant for regular types, copyable stuff. Object arguments are always passed by shared pointer. They have some lifetime, so maybe it creates a new one. Maybe it uses an existing one. And the Two built-in uh, lifetimes are transient, where you get a new one every time, and uh, singleton, where there's one object managed by the container and it hand hands it out to everyone. But the user can extend these lifetimes. And the third kind of argument is a collection argument, which is 
the argu expected argument type is a vector of shared pointer. And it basically says, well, you can map multiple objects into that. Um, there's two more things you can, yeah? Only vector is supported or you can? Only vector is supported, yes. Uh, the reason only vector is supported is that it would make the whole type erasure thing more complicated if, if I tried to support other container types. Um, there are two more things that you can uh, register. There's converter, which registers some function that can convert va value arguments, as I said before. Like, um, I could actually, in this example, I could make this a string. I could make this a string containing two and register a converter that knows, okay, I can, if, I, if the object wants an integer, and it, but pro, uh, I provided a string, well, I can convert that. I can parse the integer out of that. That's what you convert with, uh, that's what you register with converter. And function uh, registers a function that can be used in argument mappings, and we'll see an example of that later. I think this is hard to explain without an example. Questions? Uh, are you going to go over the interface for uh, extending the lifetime of... Uh, I can do, I don't have slides for that, but I can do that if I have time left. Okay. Uh, go, going back to the reflection for the, um, um, this one, the, eh, one more. Specifying the uh, factory for types. Um, so if I brought in a type that ha had maybe multiple constructors, do I have to specify all of them with the factory, or is I can just sort of expose a subset to this? Um, so the question is, if a type has multiple constructors, do I have to expose all of them or just a subset? The answer is, um, any type or factory uh, registers exactly one signature. Oh, okay. So uh, if you have multiple constructors, then type will select the one that fits the arguments you specified here. Okay. And if you, want, if you want to create the same object with a different constructor, you have to register that again under a different type name. Gotcha. But if I had sort of my own code that I wanted to bring in here and it had, I used it in different situations, I could just sort of expose it to this system with one sort of interface or expose several of them with multiple registrations. E I think the answer is yes, but I'm not sure if I understood the question. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you determine whether a factory matches the arguments? Is it solely based on the argument names or? How do it determine uh, whether a factory matches an argu the argument list? Well, um, I basically, well, I know the type B. Yes. And I know that the first argument is an integer. Right. So I internal generate, uh, instantiate a template that says, well, if I want to create a B and I pass an integer, well, try to call the constructor with an integer, and overload resolution takes care of the rest. The, the argument names here are irrelevant. I could call this something else than it is here. There is no connection between the source code and the argument name, because there is no way to, for me to access it. Okay, it's just a matter of the order of these argument specifications and, and, and the, the types, and it just does a okay, so overload I, resolution. I, I think I just understood something. So you can only have one factory for each type, or can you have more than one? You can have more than one factory for, for a type, but um, type, detect, type, de, uh, type name deduction would get to the same name, and that would be a conflict and would throw. But you can say, well, I have type B, and it takes one int and it constructs a B, but I could also say, well, type B, and I explicitly call it B with two arguments, and say, well, now I can register the constructor with two arguments. Okay, so, when, uh, So if we look at this, this off type fixes you into one specific constructor. Okay. But you could just specify a different name. If you register the t same type again under a different name, you can specify the different name here and use it this way. That makes sense. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, I, I was just wondering whether, uh, can you come back to slides, uh, please? <coughs> oh, three slides. Oh, here. It's like, I was wondering whether you support 
uh, aggregate as well. So if you don't have a constructor, but just members, and uh, would be initialized as well. The question is, do I support aggregate initialization for any of this? The answer is no. Uh, if you want aggregate to use aggregate initialization, you probably need to register it as a factory and do a lambda, and the lambda does the aggregate initialization internally. Um, the thing is, when I, when I wrote this, aggregate initialization wasn't really important to us, so I never considered this use case. All right. There's more things you can pass to configure, and those are concerned the object tree. Like we've seen object that defines a named object. The name can be empty, so it can be the default object. Um, you name the type of this object by using the register name. It's again a string. Everything here is strings. Uh, you bind the arguments, like you say map, and you take the registered name of that argument. In our case, it was i or a. Um, and then you say map to and you specify anything, it actually captures what you specify in a boost any and will try to convert it to the actual needed type um, and any registered converters will be considered for doing that conversion and it will actually even consider chains of converters like maybe you have a converter from white string to string and a converter from string to int and if you give it a white string that contains an int it will actually chain those together to, to get to the final result um, you can bind, if it's an object argument, you can bind it to a different registered object or you can even actually do inside the map to, you can define an inline object for this particular mapping. We'll see an example of that too. And you can bind to the result of a function call, a uh, function registered with the function specifier earlier and we'll have an example of that too. Um, you can, um, in an object declaration, select the lifetime. So this is really a per mapping thing. Uh, or uh, at least a per object thing. So I can register a type and I can do create two different objects of the type with different lifetimes. Uh, there is an alias uh, declaration that you can just say, well, I have this object and I want to give it two different names. Uh, a typical use case is well, I want an object and I want it to be, maybe I want here, um, let's go back to this, maybe I want this named, C, uh, this, this named B2 um, be known as B2 as an A, but the default object for A should be something different and I want the default object for B, I want this to be this object. Now I can say, well, I can say I have this B2 and it will be known as a B2 of type B and a B2 of type A. And then I can say, well, for type B2, uh, for type B, alias B2 to empty, which means that the empty name for B2 for the type B also maps to this object, to really the same object. So if that's a singleton, the user gets the same object. But the default object for A will be something different the al alias does not override for, for provided types but it's only for that particular type um, and decorator is basically support for wrapping all objects that implement a specific interface into an other objects that also implement this interface like a logging wrapper and the big example that comes up will have an example of this too Yes. Uh, for the lifetime stuff to, to make sure I understand. So if I, I the two that are easily to, to, to see is like the instance and then the singleton. Yeah. And so if it's singleton, does that mean that when you, uh, the equivalent of the, the get to the, uh, I forgot what it was called, the acquire. Um, resolve. Resolve. So yes. that gives you the share coiner to the singleton that exists. Yes. And it came into existence on the first call to resolve and it'll just be there for the lifetime of the container. Question is uh, for singleton lifetime. Yeah, uh, what? How does the lifetime exa work exactly? Yeah. So yes, the answer is the moment you first resolve, it will instantiate and then keep it around to the lifetime of the container. It won't go away again until you destroy the container. Okay. 
Um, so just to explain the, the lifetime thing, if I do this, then if I do this again, I get back the same pointer, right? It will point to the same object. But bec that's because shared lifetime is the default. But if I set at this point, um, I here, here I could say dot with lifetime transient, then it would give me, if I do this and call it again, it would give me a different point uh, to a new object. So this is how the lifetimes are configured. Yes? Can you get a unique pointer out of it? Can you get a unique pointer out of it? No. Because lifetimes are configured at that part that doesn't use templates anymore. What I could do in theory is say, okay, I support different point types. Um, and if the lifetime is not compatible with this, with the point type of this particular argument I throw, but that would make the internal machinery a lot more complicated because I already do my lifetimes. The, the way user extensive lifetimes work is based on shared pointer. So every object will be in a shared pointer, no matter what. So, so the following comment will be, so all your classes and objects have to have shared pointers or values, otherwise it won't work. The question is, all, all constructor arguments of all my, my types must be either values or shared pointers, or it won't work. That's correct, yes. So um, you basically have to write your code respecting the fact that you're using this library. So is there any way to inject something for the third party? Like you have a library which has different constructor and you cannot change it, yeah? and you would like to bind it to something else, but if you have a third party library and the objects or their types do not follow this model, you can either write your wrapper object that does, or maybe it's sufficient to write a factory function that knows, well, I get shared pointer and I know how to give the external library, the third party object, the arguments in the, in the way it expects. It is possible, yeah. yeah. You, can, you, you can register arbitrary factory functions. Oh, wait, that's already a usage example. <laughs> um, all right, let's do a complex, a complex example, right? Um, so in this, I have a command. It's an interface, it does something. And I have an application that will use these commands to react to certain instances. And I want to use dependency injection to configure, OK, what kind, what kind of command will be used. And um, I have a logger, uh, a very weird specialized logger interface that has a log function. And it, it's given a source type and a source ID and some integral ID that means something. Uh, it's given a source function and it gives an action whether the function was entered, whether it left successfully or if it threw an exception. And I want this all to be locked. Like every command action, every time a command runs, I want its action to be locked via this logger. Um, so how do I do that? Well, I have some implementations for this command. Let's say I have a foo command that does something and a bar command that does something. I won't show these classes because they're not interesting. And in one case, I actually have a multi-command where I say, OK, I want to multiplex to multiple commands. So I don't, the, the application only has one command and says, I run this. And I want actually to execute two commands. Well, I can write a command implementation that looks like this, that contains a vector of other commands it takes this as a shared vector of shared pointers in, in its constructor. And the run function just iterates over this and calls run for every subcommand. All right, so at the bottom, I have some in injection container. And it says, OK, this is my, my reflection information for this type, right? Um, I have the type multi-command. And its constructor takes a collection argument of type command. A collection argument means it's a vector of shared pointers. And this type implements the command interface. Clear? Good. And then I say I also have 
a special decorator, which is the logging command. And logging command says, okay, I get an inner command, I get a logger, and I get an ID for this command that I should add to the logger. And the run function, what it does is, well, it starts, it logs that it's entering the function, it actually runs the inner function, and it logs that the inner function, the inner function completed, and if I catch any exception, I log that fact and rethrow it. Um, now, I could build the object tree by just saying, giving every every command that a register say, well, okay, and I want to wrap that, so I register a specific logger command for that, but um, <coughs> we have, in, in this library, we have a nicer way of doing that. Oh, the, this is not done yet. So, okay, I have some private members and the configuration is pretty much the same as the other things. I have an object argument of type command, I have an object argument of type logger, and I have a value argument of type int. Um, Here's the app class, which takes one command in, and at some point it will probably call run on that. Uh, this one is very simple. It just takes in some command. Uh, I also have an, an, a logger implementation. It's just a null logger. It does nothing in its log implementation. and. As you can see, the, the configuration for this is trivial. It does not have any constructor arguments. It just uses the default constructor. Um, here's the same thing. How do, we, how do we get the IDs? Here's one way of getting the IDs. As Well, I have a class sequence. And sequence has a function next that just, it starts at some integer. And every time you call next, it gives you the next one. So every time you call next, it increments. And I can say, well, I have this type sequence, and it takes a value argument of type in it, int in its, for its initial argument. And that integer actually has a default. It defaults to zero. If I don't specify an explicit value in its mapping, it will just use zero. And here is this function registration thing, right? I register in the container, I register a named function called next ID. And I say, well, I want to register the sequence next member function. And this function takes arguments, specifically it takes an object argument of type sequence that I call this. Um, it's a member function, so it needs a this pointer. It doesn't have any other arguments, so it comes down to a one argument function. Yes? Is this special in that context? No. Okay. The just question is, is this special in this context? The answer is no, it's just a string. But I call it this because it will be the this pointer for this function call. Um, from a software engineering standpoint, it's probably a better idea to call this sequence because it looks nicer in the mapping. But I didn't think of this when I made the slide. Um, and now I can build my object tree. So I say, well, my default app maps its some command argument to the combined command object. The combined com command object has type multi command and it maps the commands object to these two objects an inline configured object of type foo command and an inline configured object of type bar command. So this is basically. The, the shared object works exactly the same as object, except that you don't have to specify a name because the name would, would be discarded. Because an inline configured object cannot be looked up by name. It's just used in this particular location. Um, but there's no logging there still. I haven't used the logging command yet. And this is where decorator comes in. I say, well, for the interface command, I specify a decorator. Every time you give someone a command object, wrap it in a logging command. Give it a logging command and map the inner argument of the logging command to the wrapped object. So when this here creates the vector of command shared pointers, 
the shared pointers won't point to the foo command and bar command objects. They will point to, to specifically created wrapper objects of type logging commands, and their inner members will point to these objects. Um, and the ID for this for the logger will be mapped to well a dynamic call to this next ID function where this is mapped to the command ID sequence and the command ID sequence is defined here as well it's an object of type sequence and I as you can see here I don't map the the initial parameter of this type so it will default to zero And in the end, I retrieve this app, and this is what it, the object graph will look like. I have the app, and it refer references a logging command, which wraps the multi-command. The multi-command will contain uh, two more commands. Both are wrapped by a logging command, and one is a foo command, and the other a back bar command. And all three, all three logging commands reference the same null logger. Can you back to the null logger class? Okay, so they, they're sort of, are they isas? Are they, are they, um, when you say they refer to. So, um, so the question is what, what does it, what do, do I mean by they refer to? Yeah. So I configured. <sighs> I configure and sh here I say the logger of this of this decorator wrapper okay. refers to a shared object of type null logger. Okay. So because this is a shared object, every logger that is created gets his own. I could instead say private object here, then every logger uh, every sh every logging command would get its own logger. Mm -hmm. This is usually probably not what you want in the case of logging. Okay. I was going back to your early language of transient versus singleton. Yes. That's basically exactly, you're just using different languages. The, the right. early language of transient and singleton, yes. So shared object is basically a shortcut to write object with an empty name with, si with singleton lifetime, and okay. private object is object with an empty name and transient lifetime. Mm -hmm. There's are just convenience wrappers because we use this quite a bit. So. Here is the object graph we build, and well, this will log a lot. One thing to consider, um, the IDs that these get, well, uh, the order is probably going to be this one gets ID 0, this one gets ID 1, and this one gets ID 2. So it's guaranteed that these are created before this one, because I need these to create this, and I need this to create this, because of the way the dependencies work. but. I don't actually have a guarantee which of these is created first. It will just go through the initializer list that was specified and probably create them in this order. Um, so, but every time it creates a logging command, it calls the next ID function, which is the next member function of the sequence. And because the sequence is a shared object, it's a singleton object, it's the same sequence and it will return incrementing IDs. So every logging command gets its own unique ID. Can we go back go forward one slide? Um, object command ID. Is it just the logging commands or does all the commands get the, get a command ID sequence? Um, the question is, do only the logging command or all commands get a command ID sequence? So the map ID to call this function is specified for logging command. Okay. So every command will be wrapped in a logging command and every logging command will get its own I ID. I was looking at the, nec the next one, the object command ID sequence. Okay. Oh, the object command ID sequence, there is one global okay. command ID sequence. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was misreading your yeah. structure. So, but if, if I wanted a different type of object that also needed uh, unique IDs, I could create a second a sequence object called maybe, I don't know, thread ID sequence mm -hmm. and use next ID with the thread ID sequence to give a different kind of object, different, mm -hmm. uh, okay. different sequence of IDs. 
Yes. I'm assuming you've got some debugging facilities that allow you to extract that graph. Through, um, through he assumes I have some debugging facility. You assume correctly. Okay. So <laughs> there is an interface that allows me to track <coughs> object construction. I have not actually implement have not implemented this interface for actually drawing this graph. So this was hand drawn. Okay. See? So can you go forward one? So uh, yeah, okay. when you say map logger to shared object no longer, if you're actually doing that, you would probably say to logger and let the system figure out um, somewhere else that it, so no logger as a logger. I I'm not sure what you mean. So, <laughs> so what? Uh, so uh, there's some confusion about this line. Uh, yeah, so I basically I could. So as written, that hard codes no longer. Well, it yes, but but I mean I could this this string for example could come from a configuration file. Yes, I suppose. But if you just said logger instead, would that still work? <sighs> if I just said logger here, that would not work because I don't have a register type called logger. I have a registered interface called logger, but you cannot instantiate an interface. And would you, would right. you get but if you have a thing that I could, I could, I could leave this line out completely and say, well, it wants a logger, and there's gonna be a, a configured object of type logger with the empty name, and say, well, that has to be configured somewhere else, and then there it could configure it to be a null logger or a console logger or whatever. Or I could also say map logger to, and put a string here to say to the logger, and, and, and configure an object with the name the logger, which implements logger somewhere else. I was just getting confused about what shared object means. Yeah. So shared object basically means, well, I don't want to go somewhere else. I just want to do it here, right here, right now. I don't want to configure an extra object somewhere. Uh, it's basically a shortcut. Yeah. I was just wondering whether it's not difficult to have like different modules, and in each of those you register logger as a different one, because in the end you will get the one which is registered as the last one, yeah. Mm. So isn't that confusing for the user that I expected this one, but however, someone in created a new module and created something else, and suddenly I got a different one, which I can see in my module that I register this one. Mm -hmm. So the question is, isn't there confusion if, the, if different programmers, presumably in different modules, configure loggers, their own loggers, with the, with the same name and one overrides the other? It could be confusing. We haven't had this problem because we basically say, well, there is one central location where such global facilities as a logger are configured. And Nobody else configures his own logger. Yeah. Um, there is no basically it's an it's a silent override and there is no help for you if it happens. So yeah. yes, if it happens to you, you have a problem. Yes, because I can see like when you pass the container as a reference somewhere else, yeah. it's like somewhere, somewhere and yeah. there is like yeah. So it could happen. We haven't had this problem so far. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should, should have a way of saying, oh, I want to configure an object. And if someone tries to override me, then throw an exception, because this is, this is the real object. Well, for example, in DI, the way I've done it is like I have override, so yes. I have to explicitly say override yeah. it. Yeah. It's like this way, I know that. So in Boost DI, you have to explicitly allow overriding. And the reason I don't is that I automatically configure the default object for every type, and it would get lots of conflict for the interface <coughs> this type implements, because the default object for an interface keeps getting overridden. Um, that was actually the main consideration for that. It was just made it easier for me, and, and, and so far I haven't seen the drawback in, in, in actual usage. Stephen, was there another question? Okay. Can I have a question here, for example? Because you said that you uh, detect uh, cycles. Yes. So here, if you had uh, logging, which like logger depends on common and common depends on logger, mm -hmm. would that would that have an exception or what? Um. So the question was so. Um, 
if I have a cycle here, like uh, logger depends. So if, if, if this logger class itself wanted a command, and then it would try to wrap the command in a, share, in a, in a wrapping logger, yes, it would throw an exception. It would, it would detect the cyclic, the cycle, that it tries to instantiate a logger, uh, but this logger is currently being instantiated, then it will throw. Would it also throw an exception if you have an interface? In between. Would it throw an exception if I have an interface in between? I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's like if you have two interfaces and you yeah. go the same path, different path, but in the end you get the cycle. Uh, yes. So I detect cycles, but really there's, there's a facility that says um, I instantiate something of this type, and this thing sets an internal Boolean variable of I'm currently instantiating, and if it re-enters the instantiation function it will throw, no matter what path it took. That's actually one of the biggest flaws of iteration 3 of IOC++ was that it was impossible to detect cycles. And we had cycles and then we had program crashes. And the way the, way the configuration for that thing worked was that it wasn't possible to detect cycles. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the implementation of the library. Um, so, essentially what I do is I, I build conversion graphs. The, the, the library contains a graph component that says, well, if you have a string and you want to get an object, here's the steps you have to do to convert this. And so what do you do if there are multiple ways? What do I do if there are multiple ways? I choose the shortest one. Short. Yeah, and if the multiple ways are the same length, then I believe I choose whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I can look at that. Um, so, like for an object, what happens is if you give me a string and the argument is, up, but is actually of type object, well, then I say, okay, the I know, I know how to get from a string to an object. So the first thing I have to do is I, I have to take this string and look for an object configuration with this name. When I have an object configuration with this name, I can say, okay, give me a object provider for this type. And when I have the object provider for this type, I can tell the provider, okay, give me an object. So uh, there's one more step then. Uh, there's <laughs> um, and, and I know I have this graph and the, the, the vertices are the types and the edges are the conversion functions. So I just call them in order. And the way it works internally is I have this registry cl class internally and it has a function called convert object. And you give it a reference to boost any and you give it a desired target type and it says, okay, the any currently contains this type, this is what I want to get look for a path. If I find it, follow the path by calling the conversion functions and converting the boost any in place until it reaches the final type. And if I can't find a path or any of these functions fail somehow, I throw an exception. So if the function, if the convert object function returns normally, I'm guaranteed that this boost any contains, uh, contains the desired target type. So if you have multiple paths and the first one fails, do you try others? If I have multiple paths and the first one fails, do I try others? Yes, I do. So I have an, an, in my test cases, I have one test case that registers two converters from string to integer. The first parses the integer and fails if it can, and the second just returns the string length. And the test case succeeds even if, so if the, if the string contains an integer, well, it will parse that integer, and if it contains something weird, it will return the length. And that actually works, and you shouldn't do that in the real world, of course, but it's there. Um, all right. So I have basically two sets of rules, conversion rules. One is for value arguments, and the other is used for object and collection arguments. And the value converters can be extended by registering converters. Um, and the reason I have this is basically so that I can take a string from a configuration file, put it in there, and don't worry about, well, what, what's the actual type that it wants. 
Uh, and I have a second set of rules for objects, and those rules are basically implicitly uh, extended by registering types. Every type you register is basically a conversion rule from a string or by, by registering types and objects of these types. So every object you register is basically a conversion rule from string, that object name, to that object type. Um, so on the implementation side I have these providers. A provider is basically an object that knows how to create actual objects. Um, and every time you use object to register an object, it creates a provider for, that, for the type of that object. And when you do a resolve, then it takes the type you asked for and the name you asked for and looks up the correct provider. And then it tells the provider, give me an object. And the provider itself has a reference to the user-specified lifetime or the u possibly user-extended lifetime and can tell the lifetime, okay, I want an object. Do you have something to reuse or should I create a new one? That's, that's basically how lifetimes work. Um, and when you register a type, what you create internally is a provider factory and the provider factory is exactly what it says on the tin, it's a factory for providers. So the dynamic type name is, there's a map from dynamic type names, like the register type name, to the factory, and then the factory, and if you declare an object of type B, then it says, okay, give me the type called B, it gives you back a provider factory and says, okay, now the provider factory gives me a provider, and that provider I store with the type and the name in the, in the, in the provider map. Um, okay, let's talk about, uh, any more questions about the implementation? I don't think I have enough time to actually show source code, unfortunately. Okay, uh, a few disadvantages of the library. First, it generates a lot of object code internally. So I had a talk yesterday about reducing that code bloat that mm -hmm. the library generates, and then I managed to reduce it quite a bit. It's still, it's still a lot of code. Um, there is quite a bit of overhead when I create objects. There are several virtual calls. There's everything wrapped in Boost Any. Um, there are even some dynamic casts. Um, it's definitely not as efficient as Boost DI. It's the price I pay for the, for the fully dynamic configuration. Um, and the configuration errors are only detected at runtime and in some cases only if you actually request the object. If you never request, well, wrong reflection information is detected at compile time. If you, do a, if you register a type and the constructor arguments you specify don't correspond to any constructor, it will actually fail there and probably give you a horrible compiler message because I've not optimized for that. Um, it uses shared pointer everywhere. Like, there's no way to say, okay, but I want, I want a unique pointer to this object. No, you don't get it. You get a shared pointer. Can I use boost shared pointer as well? Can I use boost shared pointer as well? The answer is no. <laughs> you use the shared pointer. <laughs> You have a library which has boost share pointer and you internally use uh, STD share pointer. Would it convert to boost share pointer? Um, if I have a library that uses boost shared pointer, but I use std shared pointer, would it convert? I don't know. Does boost shared, con shared pointer have a conversion from std shared pointer? No. Then it won't. <laughs> no. So the reason is that I have like library interface so things that are not templates and are specified in terms of the shared pointer. So I have to use the shared pointer. Uh, and the current version is not thread safe at all. There's nothing you can do that is thread safe. Retrieving objects is not thread safe. Never mind configuring objects. So this is one thing that I eventually want to improve in the library. I want to make it actually, at least retrieving objects, I want to make that thread safe. Is it exception safe? Do you have any guarantee for Is it exception safe? Um, yes. So everything provides at least the basic exception guarantee. 
um, and it will it, it does not provide the strong exception guarantee but it does not destroy your configured information if an exception th is thrown so um, it does some internal caching so if any so the logical state does not change and, uh, and from the logical state point of view it ha actually has the strong exception guarantee uh, I think at least maybe if some out of memory exceptions are thrown during contain operations it may forget stuff but but if any object constructor for example throws or any conversion throws that that at least will not corrupt your configuration and not not remove it either so in that sense it's strong all right as I said future directions I want to make this thing thread safe I've actually considered replacing shared pointer with a even more inefficient, more dynamic thing called a handle, which can deal with, for example, if a singleton object has a dependency on a session or maybe request scoped object, that it can say, okay, what's the current value of this dependency? And that it can, that this can change after an object has been created. Um, and yes, this is the most important point. IOC++ is not open source. It's our internal library and my managers are, uh, I asked whether I can make it open source and they're like, uh, open source? W we've never done that before. <laughs> Wouldn't that mean a huge maintenance burden for us? And what's the point? So if you want this library, tell me so that I can say, well, here are people, they want to use this and if they use this, then it gets better because they will report problems, they can make suggestions, they may even contribute. So yeah, if you want this, please tell me afterwards, I could use the support. Any questions? Uh, did you actually measure the uh, runtime penalty? Or did I measure the runtime penalty? Uh, not exactly, not compared to the to the raw, um, to just manually creating these objects. Um, I did some speed optimization at some point to basically get startup time of our application down. There is some optimization done. It's The overhead is acceptable for us because our process runs for a long time and if it takes five seconds to start up instead of one, we don't care. Any other? Um, can I have a Selfish comment. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> 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 because it, well, this talk is after Kuzdia, which I was presenting, so I just wanted to say that <coughs> contextual bindings, as well as different translation units, mm -hmm. are also possible with DI. So basically, all of that is also possible. It just ninety percent will be done during the compilation. So the comment is that Boost DI has facilities that make this stuff possible too, and. I've looked at it and I think it's mostly possible. I think it's a little more convoluted to do uh, this, these complex object graphs. Uh, but yes, I believe it is possible. And I, I will actually look into that more when I get home. Well, uh, the act has the approach like in inject. So you yeah. have contextual bindings. Yeah. So instead of map, whatever you just say, for A, B, C, give me, like, that's the call stack, yeah? For yeah. A, B, C, just give me this object. Yeah, so boost DI's contextual bindings basically say, okay, if here's, here's the tree of objects that I used to get here, and in this context, bind an interface to something. And that would be the approach to take. Um, but I think, I think mapping our configuration to this system would be rather complex. I think it would be possible, but I, I'm not sure how well. I would love you to open some that because yeah. I would definitely compare it. Yeah. So you, if you need a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if my managers like the reason. Well, there's this other guy who wants to show how much better he's a one. It's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the result is, hey, it's totally easy to use yours and we don't have to manage ours anymore because. Uh, because we can just use yours, then yes, that's a gain, a net gain for us. But I still not sure if I can sell it to my managers. <laughs>
Any other questions? Like 50 minutes left. So Great. Um, so I think you asked for the lifetime extension point. Mm -hmm. um, so um, basically, this is the interface for a lifestyle. If you want to implement your own lifestyle, you basically imp yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Is that readable? Yes. Awesome. Um, let's also remove the the rep margin. Make that. Can you actually show it? Since it's not open source. I can show some parts. <laughs> um, so this is the user extension point. You have this lifestyle, and a lifestyle is basically a, an an interface. You implement it, you register in the container, you register an object of that type and the name becomes the name of the lifestyle. So you can then say with lifestyle specify a string the name of your registered lifestyle object and that works. And so how it works is this factory function is used uh, when the container creates an, a new provider and it wants a lifestyle manager, it keeps that around and whenever uh, an object is requested from that provider um, it calls this get function that you have to override for your own lifestyle manager and in this function you can either return some existing shared pointer you have lying around or you ask this creator to create a new object um, I can actually show you how the singleton and transient lifestyles are implemented because they use this interface. Um, this is the transient lifestyle and it basically, well, here's the transient lifestyle implementation and the create manager function. This is I'm actually cutting off something on the right side, so I'm not sure if I'm in the right source file. Yes, I am. So, well, it just, the, the create manager just creates a new instance of transient lifestyle manager, and transient lifestyle manager, the get function, just unconditionally calls create. Can I have yes. a question here? Because it seems like you said that everything will die with the container. However, here you have a single term, which will, transitional lifestyle will, you know, live. The, die, yeah. um, the question was, here's a singleton transient lifestyle. That's correct, but the transient lifestyle class does not have state. The, the, the How about the mem memory will be? Uh, there's no memory. I mean, transient lifestyle is an empty class. So it's one byte in the executable that is never initialized any, in any way. Okay, it has four bytes in the, and, and it will initialize the virtual function pointer. You're correct. <laughs> it may not even have one byte there. Yeah, yeah well. Yeah. It, well. It's, it's, it's a V table. It's basically just a V table. So, but this does not preserve any objects, right? Um, and I actually return uh, the global instance is a shared pointer that has a null, no op deleter. Um, and the singleton lifestyle works pretty much the same way. I have this global uh, singleton lifestyle instance and well the create manager just returns a singleton lifestyle manager and the singleton lifestyle manager has a private shared pointer and if you, if you call get it will say well if I don't have my singleton yet I ask to create it and otherwise I return it. Uh, I have a question related to this uh, custom deleter which is empty. Yes. Because I, I, I don't understand why. Because um, um, I can show. So, so these 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 lifestyle objects are registered in the container with a name, right? So that you can use them as lifestyles. And if I register something in a container, 
there is a special registration function called unique, where you give the container an existing shared pointer to an object and say, I have this existing object and I want to make it available under this name. And since, since, and, and, and since my, my lifestyle objects are global, they're just these static uh, variables, I say, well, here, the shared pointer that I give you doesn't actually has a no op deleter. Basically, it's an arm. Yes. So it does nothing. It's basically, basically it's a global variable and it never dies. Yes, it's a shared pointer referring to a global variable and therefore the shared pointer must not delete it ever. And the shared pointer is there just because that's what your interface requires? The shared pointer is just there because that's what the interface requires. Because the unique configuration thing expects a shared pointer so that it can hand out shared pointers. Any more questions about that? Okay, I've got how much time left? Um, it's 17 after. Yeah. Can, can you show mappings? How do you do the binding? Um, the bind. Oh. Um, essentially, um, I can show a bit of that. So it effectively comes down to this factory provider class and it has a lot of template arguments hidden in this arcs object that's a special class that just it's a policies class effectively and this um, contains like what type does this provide and what interfaces does it provide and what are the configured arguments like everything like there is this factory type in particular is um, is a function object that creates the actual object and all I have to do is when I actually create an object then what I do is I call this factory and the call factory in turn gets a tuple of argument specifications. It gets this internal object configuration which remembers okay what values were mapped and then it basically does, a, does an invoke and ex expands this resolve argument. Resolve argument takes one argument specification looks looks it up in the container the name and and gets gets the value out and and so that's basically how it works it's basically a tuple expand on this Do you have any uh, compilation times benchmark um i don't have an ongoing benchmark but i did some benchmarking while i was reducing the code bloat uh compilation times are not that great <laughs> <laughs> So it takes it takes about um, as a reference um, this is the biggest test file and it takes a Microsoft compiler about five seconds to compile it and this looks like so most of the compilation time is probably this block. And that's that's in debug mode when it generates all this debug info. But I don't have ongoing benchmarks and I don't have any performance regression or anything like that. Yeah, I think I think that's it. <laughs>